Yeti, Yeti, yes. There I am. I've done it. Uh. I still don't love this. Right, and then I love this lesson. I have learned this lesson. You go over here. Hello. Uh. Uh. Oh, eh? Oh, eh? Let's do. Um. How are we feeling today? Let's do some royalty free. Royalty free. Royalty free music. <laughs> royalty free. Royalty free chill hop. Did I try that last time? I think I tried it last time. I think I didn't like it. But that's okay. Let's do it again. Yeah, this is all this is all lame. I think was the problem. It's a little like royalty free, royalty free. Well, let's just let's see what you can. We'll just do regular old music. Ain't no one's here yet. Uh, but it takes a second for it to propagate, I think, um, which is fine. Um, I should put like a plan for what I'm actually gonna do today, because I actually don't know yet. This is weird, right? Because I'm speaking like to basically nobody right now. I think. Uh, yeah, no one's here yet. Um, yeah, I don't like this. I don't like this music. I think we might just go back to the old, the old Harris Heller's. Is it stream beats? doing here I want to go over how to set up like how to just like get yourself set up into an like a VS code environment that oh, that's me look at that what do you know what do you know oh hey Zeka welcome to the stream still just kind of getting set up but i'm still like rusty i don't know what i'm doing here <laughs> but thanks for showing up oh and there's kylie hi kylie all right people are showing up people are showing up to the party uh i was gonna what was i gonna do i was gonna turn down the music Yeah. Doom, doo, doo, doom. Yeah. And I don't really feel like doing any more. Yeah, it, it takes a second for the um like the Discord ping. Like it takes it takes like a couple minutes sometimes for that to actually get generated. I just started uh four minutes and fifty seconds ago apparently. Um, so I'm guessing, so I thought, that's what I was just checking on is like whether or not that ping actually generated. Um, and it appears not to have yet, but it probably will uh, shortly. Zeka, how'd you find, how'd you find me here? There's a cat. Yep, there it is. It says, here's John. Uh, I 
think I will. I think I will send this over to the Knowledge Fellowship because I, I do like what those guys are trying to do. And I can post it in their tech and math. Do 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 do. I don't know if that's the right way to post that, but it's fine. Oh yeah, thanks. Well, thanks for having push notifications from me, Zeka. Uh, all right. Yeah, it's been a long week. Um, they're all long. Weeks are long these days. Look at this week, Kevin. Last time, I think, when I last the last round of streaming, uh, was shortly after I got these little little kibbums, and at that point in time, he was still like hiding under the bed. Uh, yeah, have you, Zeke, are you, are you, I, I think I've seen you in because uh, I've come back to this. I've started doing it. I think at this point, I'm in my third week of like one stream a week, um, and I think I've seen you pop up once or twice. If I recall correctly. And uh, I appreciate it. Um, so, what's the plan? So today, uh, we are going to check my messages for no reason. Uh-oh. Yeah. Ah, well, thanks for popping by. That last one was fun. I, I, I like, like I, I mentioned this in the stream before, but like now that I've got like kind of more work to do, it feels like a much more uh, rewarding thing to be streaming. Because I think the last time it was a lot of setup, um, which ironically is the plan for today as well. Except now I think I kind of know what my setup plan is. Um, so. How am I going to do it, though? Because what I want to do today... Oh, hi, Micon. How are you doing? Yeah, people showing up now. It's interesting because I, I think there's a lag between, like, when people show up and when it actually the number actually uh, clicks up. Um, but that's just not me figuring it out. So I am currently sitting here in snowy, snowy Boston. Uh, I'm going to show you a scene outside my window. Let's look at it go. Look at that winter, winter weather. It's nice. Uh, let's spare a thought. Show kitty cam. Show kitty cam. I can do show kitty cam. Kitty. Say hello. Oh, hey, that's. Meow, meow, meow. Meow, meow, meow. This is Ollie. He's a cat. He's a wee kibum. And he's in his box that he loves. Actually, that's his that cardboard box over there is his actual favorite box, but he he's okay with this one too. This one's fine too, but I think it's a little too. Uh, I think he likes having a little bit of space. Oh, huh, that's nice. Let's we should all spare a thought for Texas because they are they are suffering down there right now. And you can say what you want about like whether or not like politics aside like there there are some people who are in a pretty bad straight um and i am from texas so i have a soft spot for them poor frozen cowboys uh my mom is down there she currently i think she said she has power no she, she's like they're doing rolling blackouts i'm not sure if they're if, if her power her, her power i think was back on but she didn't have water um last i talked to her uh which Oh yeah, yeah. The y'all in Finland know you're in Finland. That's cool. So we got a fin a Finlander of Bel Finns and Belgishes and various flavors of American. It's a whole international, whole international affair right here. 
Um, Belgian. Yeah. Nice. I spent a little bit of time in Belgium once, but I think we talked about this. Like I, I took a trip through. I had some. I have some family friends that live in Belgium, and I like. I saw the little little piss kinder and all that, and ate the French fries or whatever it is. <laughs> um. Okay. Uh. So the plan for today. Uh, is I want to sort of go over um, my methodology for like getting set up with like just establishing an environment like a Python environment to do work. Um, I'm not by any means like an expert in that as anyone would know, but at this at this point, I kind of have a system more or less figured out to like, set up an environment and like just like set like I'm, I use VS code specifically um, and I to get it set up to a place where you can start writing code um, I think that specifically no, I think I'll just do that um, I was gonna say um, so I I like I, I tried so PyCharm and spider both appeal to me um, because they're kind of, they're tools that seem like nicely set up to be used for data science. That's what they're for. Um, I have a slightly more appreciate, I slightly prefer, um, spider to PyCharm just because spider feels like a little more like open source and open like that PyCharm. It kind of has that thing where it's like, if you want to use our most useful features, you got to pay for them. And like, I have kind of always mixed feelings about that. Um, and of course you should support people's work, but at the same time, it always feels kind of, it's not, not the, not the open source vibe that I'm looking for. The pro, the reason I don't even have a problem with them, but the reason why I chose not to use them is that, um, they, they, they do a little bit of work for you and they do work for you in order to be a more useful tool for data science. But I, I kind of am at a, a point in my life where, um, I kind of want to know how things work. Um, I don't want the hand holding. Um, so Spider in particular seems like it's it's specifically set up to be to be like MATLAB, um, and I have MATLAB experience. So I think if I if I had jumped into Spider, I would have gotten in up and running faster than if I had used VS Code. Um, but I think that the the extra effort that it took me to figure out how to navigate VS Code forced me to kind of understand what was happening under the hood a little more, um, which I think ultimately I feel like PyCharm and Spider, they kind of have training wheels on, um, which is good in a lot of ways. Um, uh, but I think, I think I personally benefited from like taking a little bit of extra time to figure out how to set up VS Code in the way that I needed it to be set up to do my job, uh, to do my, the kind of work I want to do. Um, and so I don't even necessarily recommend it to people. It's just, that's what I use because I feel like it's lack of training wheels um, sort of forces you to kind of like understand what's going on a little more with like how it, like what's pointing to what. And I think that, hi mom, um, I guess you do have power. Uh, this is my, Sharud it is my mother and she is in Texas and she is apparently has life together enough to be My cat doesn't think much of anything. He's he's a sweet, but he just wonders when he's going to get fed. Uh, also, he gets he has plenty of experience of experiencing me talking to myself. Um. Okay. Anyways, uh. So I think what I'll do is um. Cause there's some work I wanted to do with the open mocap stuff like this, this thing over here. Um, and, uh, what I will do is I'm going to, cause I want to, so this representation is pretty sloppy in a lot of ways. Um, it's using matplotlib, which is a sort of figure. It's like a plotting toolbox in Python very commonly used and designed to be like MATLAB, which again is my most, most of my experience. 
Um, but it's limited in a lot of ways. And I've been playing recently with Plotly and Dash, which I think are better suited towards like building kind of interactive data dashboards um, in a way that interacts nicely with like websites and HTML and all that kind of stuff. Uh, which I think is ultimately what I'm going to be moving more towards in terms of the the visual representation, the visual output of the open mocap stuff. Um, but I don't know how to use it, and it's not familiar to me. The nice thing about Matplotlib... Uh, oh, yeah, I have Kite, actually. Kite, it's like... It, it come, it, like I think I got... It's like There's like a... You have like a, a free version of that, and I do... I do appreciate Kite for it because it does seem to kind of uh, keep the document, like it provides easy inroads to the documentations of various things. Because um, one of the one of the things that's really nice about MATLAB is all the documentation is just built into the system. It's all the same format. It's all together. Um, whereas in Python world, you kind of have to like bounce around the internet and try to find for each toolbox or module you're using, you have to find the tool that does it. But um, so I do appreciate Kite. At the moment, I'm not fully savvy on like which of the things. Yeah, I, I've, I've been encountering that. I, to be honest, I'm a, like there's so much stuff like, like VS Code, I'm not fully clear on like which of the helpful toolboxes that pop up are from Kite and which ones are from VS Code and which ones are from, are from PyLance, which I think I also have installed. Um, but I'm very much into the, the model of education where you just kind of, you throw yourself into the middle of the problem and then kind of back your way out, uh, and then try to figure things out along the way. So right now, as I'm writing code, helpful stuff pops up from time to time. Uh, oh yeah, I do see that. Yeah. So that's kind of, that's, and that's the challenge, right? That's like getting the environment set up is is a challenge and I am, I am very much a Python novice myself. So, um, and so I've been talking to people in my lab. So like Kylie, who's on here has been trying to get up and running with some of this stuff. Uh, and it's a challenge because, because it's a challenge. And so, um, what I'm going to do on this stream, and I'm going to get started shortly before I get too distracted by chat. Uh, cause I, I will run out of steam, uh, sooner rather than later, uh, is just to sort of put something together in this stream that can kind of be used as like a tutorial-ish object for setting up a Python environment to do Python code in the way that one must do such things. Um, yeah, no, virtual environments are, are absolutely critical. I think that like, especially if you're working on more than one thing at a time, like you, like it's really necessary to get to like do Python to do virtual environments. Um, <laughs> yeah, Java, J I don't know Java's or JavaScript. I don't even bother with that. <laughs> um, but I have my friend, I have a friend, uh, John Lindstead, who is my go-to for Java knowledge. He's like, he's a computer science professor. Um, and he is much more savvy on all of this stuff. Um, although he has, he does, he does know Python, but he's his, like, I think his main bag is Java, JavaScript, uh, which is not related to Java. Like what the fuck? Um, uh, I should stop showing you my emails. Um, uh, what am I saying? Right. But let us, let us discuss things. I'm trying to think of the right way to like organize the screen. Um, I know. Yes, we're gonna set up in VS Code with Anaconda. I did see the Perseverance photo. I'm very excited about it. I like that it has, I'm very, the thing I'm most excited, well, I'm excited about a lot of parts of it. Um, but the most thing I'm most excited about is the little like uh, the little drone copter on it, because um, I think that's cool. And like, you know, like th these rovers are cool, but they're they're very limited in their range. Um, so I think like 
having f- like flying like and, and drone technology has, has come so far on earth that like i feel like at this point like we can i mean we can and i guess we have make a drone system that's like robust enough to put on another planet um and i think that's really going to be kept critical towards like to being able because like even curiosity like it hasn't gone very far from where it landed because it's it just it can it's slow um yeah and the drone we've got to get some scale oh also like that's also leading up to uh that is a test i think that that's a test case and they're talking about it mostly for mars but that technology is also being considered for um missions to titan which titan man that's a that's a weird that's a weird place um one of i think it's one of saturn's moons um and it's they they would need to be a drone over there because i don't, i think that I, I think they don't the titan i don't know what I don't, we don't know what's on the ground in titan titan's a weird place it's got oceans of hydrocarbons oh really i didn't know that they just like eh, let's stick a drone on it <laughs> we have some extra weight um i know i've seen some other i think it's like firefly there was there's some like proposed mission to titan that uses a drone um and i'm sure they will be super stoked to get some test data my fear for the drone is it's going to do what drones do which is like <laughs> crash uh but i'm hoping that they get some good stuff I, I i i can't imagine that drone will have a very long lifetime um relative to how long those rovers last because those rovers last years and years um, and I, I just can't imagine that drone will last that long um but who knows um like if anything else the dust will get it before uh anything but hopefully but i think th- those missions often have they have their parameters of like what they're hoping to accomplish and like they usually the parameters are usually very uh modest i think it, i think they probably took that into account uh cuz i think that's part of the st- the part of the purpose of the of the of the drone is to figure out uh, flying in Martian atmosphere and at this point we know enough about Martian atmosphere that like I'm pretty sure that they if they, they, they have they, I'm pretty sure they, they did the math right that the thing will fly um I just don't think it'll last very long uh which is probably not oh that's cool I, yeah Veris, Veritasium what a guy Yeah, ex- I think that's. I'm guessing if you were to look into like the NASA's like mission parameters about the drone, it was probably something like, like the the mission parameters are probably like, uh, fly at all and get a picture. Um, so that way when they actually get like ten flights, they'd be like, see, look, we exceeded parameters by super high amount. Um, at this point, I think those guys have been around. Uh, they know how to. They know how to do that. They know how to do what they do. Okay. Let's get to work. Um, I think I am. Oh, I don't. Is it? It's all the way over there. Uh, let's do. Let's move you down here. You're not really necessary. That's cool. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I have a friend who is a uh, who is an engineer at. Oh, she's actually she's been on. She's popped into the stream once or twice. Um, back when I used to like advertise. Let's do this. Can I do this? This new new. Um, let's do this, and then I will say. Uh, oh, no, let's, do, let's use obsidian, like cool people. This is not. Oh, I guess I can do it on this page. Um, personal. Let's make a new one. Let's call this stream plan. Uh, 2021-02-19 underscore stream plan. Why do I do underscore? I don't know. It's a sickness. Um, and let's see. 
what we will do, uh, so we'll, we'll look into um, installing Anaconda and then opening open Anaconda command prompt and then create an anaconda environment environment uh, and then open VS code uh, oh yeah um, sort of uh, What's, what's the word like like uh, select Python interpreter interpreter uh, set up VS code debugger install stuff to vir virtual environment and then go to town that's the plan that's what we're gonna be working on today um, and we're going to, and how I will do that is I'm going to make, uh, no, a source, a source, and it will be a window capture and it will be a, obsidian. <laughs> yeah, so basically, because it's, it's, this is mostly just a roadmap for myself, so I, I don't, like, lose track of, um, of, like, of where I'm going, because what I really want to do, oh, look at that, because what I actually want to do is I want to work on, um, if I have time, which I'm, which we'll see, I want to see how far I can get with, um, doing plotly, uh, do, using Plotly to like make a better visualization of this uh, skeleton data, um, which I almost certainly won't make much headway on today. But uh, if nothing else, I can set up the virtual environment to to do that. Um, interpreter. So one of the things of of thank you. Uh, I like interpreter. Interpreter. I've been trying to embody the spirit of ballistic texting, like messaging and like emailing. Like uh, this is something I was told by like a senior PI, senior professor when I was in like grad school. Just like, it's like the less you think about what you write, the quicker you can respond to stuff. And so like, you know, I've been trying to like embody that, like just like don't proofread, you don't need to. Like, like it's better for me to respond quickly and like let you kind of like, like net you like my students like kind of just like look at my typos and figure it out then for me to like put the extra energy in to like make sure that it's like well formatted because like if I do that then I can send fewer messages and ultimately like it's better for me to send like 10 sloppy typo ridden messages than to like send like five like better tuned stuff and like the emotional cost of fixing a typo is non-zero so anyway let's let's get to work oh there's people here hello people welcome to this place we're going to be doing uh boring bookkeeping work <laughs> uh but no it's not that boring it is kind of boring so um kylie i mentioned this uh i I already kind of have a lot of the stuff installed on my computer, but I'll kind of I'll kind of go through the motions. Um, Matt Frew Frew Frewer Frewer Matt Frewer. <laughs> this guy. <laughs> yeah, I'll take it. Who is he? What does he do? Is he just this guy? Oh, Max Headroom. 
Yeah, I can see that. He's a little older than me. <laughs> oh, he was in the Watchmen. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll take it. I'll, I'll go. I'll be. Man. Yeah. Um, so I'll just kind of go through the motions just for completeness sake. Um, but just to be, uh, magic tricks. Yeah. Huh? Oh, um, that's interesting. I don't have enough knowledge of, uh, Matt Frewer's, uh, voice and speech patterns, but he sounds like a nice guy. Um, but yeah, so we're just going to go through the motions just to sort of set up a, uh, oh, look at that. Um, a Python virtual environment so that you can do code. It's a finger. Finger. So you do this, uh -huh. and you put them, put both your fingers down, and then do like this. Uh, da, 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 da. It's fun times. Um, okay. So there's a lot of different ways to do virtual environments, but I, I, as I mentioned in lab meeting earlier today, like I, I keep going back and forth on, um, whether or not I like Anaconda, I used to like it and then I used to not like it. And now I like it again. Um, so I think it just does a good job of, of just kind of like helping like manage some of the pythons and the Anaconda stuff. It has like the GUI navigator that, um, honestly, was really helpful when I was getting started. And then it started to feel clunky, which is why I stopped liking Anaconda. Um, but now I've come back to it and just using it from the command line. And I like it, I like it again. Like I think the GUI is, it's again, it's kind of training wheels, but training wheels are useful. Um, and like when you're like, if you don't know how to ride a bike, training wheels are useful, but ultimately eventually you take them off once you learn how to ride. Um, so, so Anaconda, it's pretty straightforward. You, I mean, insofar as any of this stuff is straightforward, but you, you just kind of go, just Google Anaconda Python, go to the installation, and then just follow the instructions. It's designed to be sort of, like Anaconda is designed to be an entry point for people to get into um, Python specifically, but I think it does other code too. Um, so download it. There's an installer. Just do the graphical installer. Don't, don't think too much about it. Uh, you're almost certainly on a 64-bit system at this point, but if you're running to issues, there's 32. And then on Windows specifically, for some reason, it has a hard... Once you've installed this, um, and just use all the default settings, um, it will put a bunch of stuff on your computer. Uh, like Spider gets installed... Um, Anaconda Navigator, that's the GUI, uh, but mostly what you're going to wind up doing, so, is you'll just use the Anaconda, or what I do is I just use the Anaconda prompt, um, which, so this is a command prompt, right, you do ls, and you got, your, oh, sorry, uh, deer, you know, it's like how you see all of your you know, stuff like that. Um, this is command line. Um, but for whatever reason on Windows, when you install Anaconda, it doesn't like, it doesn't go like it, your, your, your standard command prompts, your standard PowerShells, like don't see it. It's something about the path. I don't know. So the recommendation is that you, instead of using your systems command prompt, which you get by just typing command into the Windows file, you just you open up the anaconda prompt and for whatever reason the the logo doesn't load for me i'm not sure why um but this is the anaconda prompt you could also do the powershell i they're they're just slightly different versions of the same thing but um i just use the prompt um and now this says anaconda prompt and this is just basically the the it's like command prompt but it's being powered by anaconda uh anyone that knows more than me like i'm going to be saying things based on like how I use them. I don't like some of the things I'm saying might not be like deeply accurate, but functionally speaking, it'll get us to the right place. Um, so now here I am in Conda. I'm actually going to switch to the PowerShell. Let me see what that looks like. 
Anaconda. Anna. Anaconda. Oh, didn't like that. Yeah, there's something there's something screwy with my installation right now. Yeah, exactly, Zega. Uh, there's something screwy with my installation. Like like this red is popping up. Like this is not showing base, but it, it's it's fine. Um, so. <clears throat> Yeah, so Anaconda, so the, 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 the command to invoke Anaconda is, is just conda. So conda, if I think of dash dash help. Yeah, so if you just do that, it'll pop up all this stuff that'll, that'll try to help you. Um, and I think what I'll do is I'll wind up, I will... I'm going to make a new virtual environment. Ah. Well, there you go. Yeah, and then there's you can use like mini conda, which is like a lighter like anaconda like you can Yeah, it's again like the like I'm new enough at this stuff that like some of the details are lost on me, but like from a functional perspective, I think I can I can handle it. Um, so, right. So I'm just going to create a anaconda environment um, or a conda environment. Conda. And to do that, like, you can just Google how create conda environment. And then you'll get the documentation and it will tell you. One of the things I find really frustrating about command line. Yeah, I, my con, I feel your pain. Uh, and that's about a lot of what I've been working on is like getting to a point where I can install like those kinds of other people's code projects. And that mostly I'm working on now is like helping people for now, just people in my lab, like download and install and get to work on some repository stuff. But eventually like, the broader world as well um but yeah one of the things i find annoying about terminal stuff is like there's there's kind of some memorization involved like you have to remember command lines like the commands um so but if you just google it like so i'm gonna just be using this command right here Ooh, that's very big so conda create dash dash name my my env is what it's saying here and so from a again from a on my understanding of it, uh, I am setting up a virtual environment with 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 Anaconda. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about what that means in a second. Um, conda. So right now, so what's happening here is I type conda, which tells me which tells the system how to interpret what's coming next. So this is good. So by typing conda, I'm saying the next thing that's happening should be sort of interpreted in the conda. Uh, I'm thinking Fridays might be better for me than Thursdays. I'm not fully established my schedule yet, but nice to see you, Summer Sauce. Thanks for popping in. Uh, I'm, I'm, well, let me chug along before I get too distracted. Uh, so now that we're, now that I typed conda, it knows that it's to interpret it with the conda interpreter. Uh, sort of. <laughs> um, the reason why I think it's better for me to target the end of the week is that it makes it less likely that I'll be sort of pulled pulled away by other stuff. Um, I, every time I try to pick a day of the week to do something, um, let me see. Unfortunately, no. No, it doesn't. It, I can't make it bigger. Unfortunately, um, I can do that. <laughs> uh, but actually, I think this one I can. Let's do that. Oop. 
a little bigger. Control skull. Ooh, look at that. See? Look at that. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I knew it was something, but like I was trying like command plus, uh, but this is better. Okay, so um, I think I'll do that. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so again, so like when you're doing a command line interface, when you, like so this is this is a command line interface, uh, often referred to as CLI, command line interface. Um, uh, so I'll just, I'll shut this down and restart it, um, just because I didn't really do anything interesting at the start. So I just, in my windows thing, I say anaconda prompt. And again, like there's something screwed with my installation. That's why it says the system cannot find the path specified, but it's, it's still fine. Um, <clears throat> um, if this was working better, it would say base, but that's, we don't have to worry about that for right now. So I'm going to type in commands to this one because this is not the system command prompt. This is anaconda prompt. So anyways, it's a, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I, I figured you could do some of that sort of deeper stuff, but I, I wasn't really, I wasn't willing to, 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 to dive that deep for, for this one thing. Oh, but I do need to make that big again because that's actually all I need. Just big enough to read the text. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> so, conda tells it that this is going to be a conda command. And then, uh, well, I do kind of like changing colors of things, but we'll do we'll, we'll, one thing at a time. Eyes on the prize. Um, and so the, and the, the command that I am telling conda is create. So, what I did earlier is I just did conda dash dash help. Um, dash dash in the in the command line interface, that's like a tag. So it's so it's saying I'm just sending it the the sort of the command. It's not a, it's not even a it's not like invoking like an internal like program. It's just saying like send me the help file. Um, and almost all like, like if it's pip, if it's whatever thing you do, if you're typing it into the command line, if you do the, that thing dash dash help, it'll usually show up a help page like this and it'll show things like the commands you can do and you know whatnot we're going to be using this one create um but i think also info or list we can talk about list upgrade update i don't really understand what most of that stuff is but so we'll do conda create so we have now we're now going to create an environment. That's what Conda does. Um, oh, I see what you're saying. Am I con? Um, nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, in I don't expect to be doing much command line stuff on stream, but um, but you're you're that's a good point. Um, I think my part of my philosophy of this new stage of twitch streaming for me um is like minimizing the the amount of optimizing i try to do from the outset i think that sort of one of the life lessons i've been learning is that like it's better to just start doing stuff and let it evolve naturally rather than trying to do what i was doing before which is like really try to set everything up from the outset to be like the way it's the way it should be um and I think that's kind of a recipe for, for disaster or not disaster. It's a recipe for burnout. Um, so I'm trying to just be a little more like low effort. So, and to let myself get better at this naturally by doing it rather than trying to optimize too hard. So I think the thing you're describing of like setting the default settings, that's the kind of thing I will be playing around with, but, um, not just yet. Okay. So kind of create, so if we're going to create something. Yeah, exactly. Better to do it than to don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, okay, so condo create, um, but I have to tell it what to create. So the next part, the dash dash name, is basically defining a variable for the creation function. 
Um, and we are going to call this one, let's call it Plotly. I don't really need this um, this environment. I already I have an environment um, that I I'll show it to you in a second. Uh, so and I push enter, and then it starts doing stuff. Um, and do I want to do it? Say yes. Okay. So I have now created that environment. Um, what is an environment? Uh, Conda dash list dash n. Does that work? How do I get? How do I list the environment? Conda list environments. Oh, Conda info. Conda info. Ends. So these are all the environments that I have um, currently that are existing. This plot, oh, plotty, I did that wrong. I think I can do conda delete. <laughs> oh, conda remove. I actually made a typo in there. So I already have, um, so this open mocap is the one that I've been mostly, how do I, can I do this? Block, get out of here, Martha with your Famousness. Um, dash dash help. Remove. There we go. Um, so, wait, why is why is she still here? Get out of here, R. Martha. Oh, I see. Anyways, it's fine. Um, so, <clears throat> I think I'll do. I'll just. I'll make this environment, then I'll then I'll hop into VS Code, because I think that'll make things clearer at that point. Uh, so, right, so conda create, create, dash, dash, name, plot, Lee, which is the actual thing I was trying to do. I'm gonna make this environment as a place to play around with Plotly, which is a map, which is a Python module that I'm going to play with and I want to create it as an independent environment um, so that way I can install stuff in there and it won't interfere with any of the modules that I have installed for my other research projects right so it's like this isn't the case but like the open mocap stuff <clears throat> is an environment that I've created to to work on you know on on this like skeleton stuff and it might have a, a version of Python that it likes. It might have a version of matplotlib that it likes. And if I start playing with, with Plotly, like it might need a different version of Python. It might need a different version of matplotlib. Um, so I don't want my playing around with Plotly to ruin my, my ability to work on other projects. So that's why you make virtual environments so you can have sort of separations between the underlying sort of instantiation of Python that you're using for different codes. Cause that's, that's um, <clears throat> so that way you can have like multiple code projects running at once and they're not going, you're not going to accidentally 
install a dependency that conflicts with a dependency you need for a different project. So that's that's the that's the reason. Ooh. I'll do that. Um, color zero five. Ooh, that's nice. What about four? Oh, that's cool. Nice. Nice. Thank you. Green is hacker mode. I do like... I'm a big fan of purple, but it's a little low contrast is my problem. So let, let's be let's be cool hackers. Actually, what's, what's six? Ah, oh, six isn't bad. <laughs> seven. Get out of here, seven. That's not bad either. Uh, I think I like hacker mode. Hacker mode is nice. Mm. Oh. Oh. Oh, that's hex code, huh? Cool. Ah. And this one was. Oh, it is. It's like really subtle, but you're right. It is different. Um, cool. Thanks. So there you go. Now it's colors. Now I'm a true hacker, man. Um, <laughs> so anyways, yeah. So, okay. So conda dash dash no, info. Did I make that thing yet? I can't remember. Oh, Plotty is still there. So I, I want to delete this one because it's a misspelling. Uh, <laughs> I think I'm going to stick with, with green for now. I like the green. Green is nice and high contrast, um, which I think is good for this environment. Um, but I appreciate the I appreciate the looking up that command. That's nice. Um, dash, dash, plot. Remove dash dash name, plotty dash dash all. Get out of here, you. Get out of here. What are you talking about? Anyway, well, let's not worry about that. Conda create dash dash name, plotly. Yes. Right. So. <clears throat> So by creating a virtual, so like I was saying, by, by creating a virtual environment, you can make sort of an independent space in, uh, to, to work on code in a way that doesn't conflict with other code projects. So by default, it installs like the most recent version of Python, which I think is currently Python 3.9. But I, I, you can also specify. So if I wanted to do Python 3.7, I could do that and it would create this, um, this version of this environment with Python 3.7, which that's the, the version of Python is one of the things that you that is like one of the main reasons why you would want to do different environments because things move so fast and different packages update at different rates. So I might be so one of my projects might rely on a module that needs that doesn't work beyond 3.7. Um, but another one might rely on a module that doesn't work before 3.7. So I might need to have different installations of Python on my machine and virtual environments are a way to manage that. Hello for forgetful is forgetful Isaac. You seem new. I don't think I remember. I don't think I've met you before, but um, I'm happy that you're here. Uh, we are getting set up. We're setting up a virtual environment for Pythoning. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so now that I've created this environment, yeah, 
Well, welcome here. Uh, here we are, in the long run, we're developing an open source motion capture uh, tool for folks to be able to do such fun things as like such this as, um, but it's a long road there. Uh, so for now, um, help, I'm doing a quick song and dance to show, um, thank you. I'm glad you like it. It will, uh, soon enough be a free open source project, free open source software package that you can set up in your own home. Um, this is using, this is just four like $20 webcams, uh, that are being, that are doing, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> okay. I'm approaching the bottom of my barrel. I need to power through. Um, but thank you for popping by Isaac. And I'm glad you like my, my, my juggling skeleton. Um, so like I was saying, so now that I have, I have created this environment, um, and this is now just a place on my computer, uh, which I can actually, I can go to here. Um, let's see, C dash users. Users, John Ma, uh, dot conda. Let's see. Donma.conda envs your environments. And then here's all my environments. And here's Plotly. Uh, and then, in, oh, actually, I guess it doesn't really, doesn't really do much until you start using it. But uh, here's another one. Oh. This one? There we go. Um, I think some of the other ones were sort of like created but never used, so they don't, they don't populate themselves. But like in here, so like scripts. Ah, so like in this folder, so in scripts, you can see right down Jupiter, Python, PyShell, somewhere in here. I don't know, somewhere here or somewhere else. I don't know actually where it would be. I thought it was in... Somewhere in this folder. Maybe it's here. No. Let's just do this. Python.exe. There you go. DLC. There it is. So in here, in this environment, like you have, this is the Python executable, and this is a copy of the Python executable that when I activate this environment, that will be that will be the Python executable that is evaluating the code that I send it. And this is an independent environment that is that is now, in this environment, the DLC GPU is a separate environment to face mesh, which is a separate environment to open mocap, which is a separate environment to my base installation of Python. So again, that's kind of why it, it's very, like, it's very important to do that because that allows you to have multiple code projects that rely on different things operating on the same system at the same time. Um, and so now that I have created that Plotly environment, so I can work with Plotly, now I can activate it by saying, Conda activate plotly. <gasps> but um and now you get this little in parentheses plotly thing there, which that's that's telling you um and that's that's part of like normally if if my installation of, of Anaconda wasn't screwed up, um this would say base B A S E, meaning that um um this is happening in the context of my base installation of Python. Um, but for whatever reason that doesn't work. But when I activate this, this says, this says you are now doing this in the context of that virtual environment named Plotly. So now that I'm in there, so now if I wanted to um, install stuff, I can now say pip. So pip is the installation tool for Windows. It's a little, 
different systems have different versions of pip um like mac has like homebrew and linux has snap and they can also put pip on linux but it's, it's whatever so i can say pip install plotly and now it's installing that module to that version of python uh and that's that's important um Yeah, it'll take a second. Um, come on, buddy. What else was I trying to do here? Let's see. Create a Python environment, select a Python interpreter. Right. <clears throat> now, where this gets a little tricky, so I just installed that. I was kind of just, I'm, like, again, I'm just kind of just doing this as a, uh, as an example. Um, ah. Welcome back, Kylie. Um, that's unfortunate because the last couple minutes were the important part, but you can come back and watch it Watch it later. Um, basically, I will... So, I'll, so conda deactivate... No, deactivate. So basically, I was just showing that, like, once you create a virtual environment, it lives on your computer in a folder called ENVs. And in the ENVs folder, there is an, a version of the Python executable that is specific to that environment. Oh, hey, Layla. How you doing? Welcome back. We're, we're talking about setting up virtual environments for Python coding. Um, and uh, I'm just going to power through so I uh, can actually get through this before I before I bonk out on emotional energy, um, but it is a <laughs> you 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 can come back and you can watch it later because uh, this is I think what I'm maybe I think what I want to do is I'll I want to like cut this up I think what people do in Python and like strict the like the, the ecosystem of like Twitch and YouTube is people do these kind of like long rambly things on Twitch and then they cut it up into a more um, um, more concise sort of like YouTube tutorial thing, which, uh, I don't want to do. Maybe I can like pawn that onto somebody else in my lab. Um, so anyways, uh, so here, so now that I, that environment exists, I can activate it by saying conda activate plotly. And then this parentheses saying plotly shows up to the left of the command line saying that you have now activated that virtual environment. So any code that you write, any, any commands you send will be interpreted in the context of that specific installation of Python. It's related to the path, but it's not the same as the path. It's kind of conda kind of handles that a little bit separately from like you're, like you're like a Windows computer has a path. You can just type like like these are just like things that are on the path. So like I have ffmpeg here and like no like on my path so on a command line window i can type ffmpeg and it will know where to look for the executable to interpret that command um conda kind of operates a little bit separately from that system that's kind of what it does is it has its own kind of like internal path structure that handles some of that stuff um, but it is indeed like a thing on your computer like they're like when you create in a virtual environment with anaconda or with like virtual vn or whatever way you do it what it is doing, and again, this was something that sort of also helped me, is like it makes a folder called, and that, that one's not populated, but it makes a folder called that environment, and in that folder is a bunch of stuff, and one of those things is, is a Python executable, um, and that is the version of Python that is, that is like the, the heart of that uh, virtual environment. And... Um, and so I, I, I'm not sure if you're here for that, but like if you were to say like pip install numpy, uh, it installs numpy, it already has it there um, to, to that version of Python. Um, 
Now, this notion of of this this Python executable, this will be important uh, very shortly when I start operating this in VS Code. So now that I've um, what I'm going to do is actually a little bit redundant, or um, it could be redundant. Um, but now that this, and now that I'm, I'm in the context of this environment, uh, and I've been, in, I can install stuff to it. So I can say, pip install matplotlib, and that's going to go. It's already in there. Or I could say, it it doesn't matter. I'll just type code, um, which. Again, there's, it's kind of frustrating because it's like, like there's no way you would know this unless you just knew it. Um, but code is the thing you write to get VS Code to start. Um, that is the command line command that opens VS Code. Um, and yeah, and see, this is also uh, <laughs> I don't know how to answer that question, Hottis. <laughs> Hotis. Uh, I'm gonna close this down and oh, that you can do the that you can open them up from command line like that. Yeah, yeah, it's wild. If you really want to like, you can also do like Discord. Will open. Oh, it doesn't work on this on my Linux box. Like you can just type the name and it will open stuff like that. It's, it's right. Like because when the end, like when you're double clicking on an icon and opens an application. That's just the, the graphical interface. Under the hood, when I double click on like the VS Code icon, all that's happening is the, the, the key clicks are being translated into a command line saying, hey, open that program. And I can just do that by text. Like most of what we think of as a computer is just a graphical overlay for command line, uh, for like, commands on the command line. Ain't it wild? Um, so now I open this up. It's like I opened up. Now VS Code is open. Um, however, uh, it actually didn't quite work right because you can. So down here, again, remember when you're writing into. Actually, let me just open, make a new window. I'll make a new folder. Let's make a new folder. And I'll do it. I'll do it here and I'll make a new folder. Um, plotly test. Uh, just, just another folder for the list. Um, but it's fine. I actually do need this. So remember, when you're working with VS Code, uh, like VS Code's like base level thing, like the thing that VS Code opens is folders. It doesn't open files, it doesn't open like executables. When, when you when VS Code opens folders, so I have like like you know, so with, with this one that's a little more set up, like there's .py files, like those are Python scripts, um, but I don't ever want to just like go like I don't really want to go into the folder and open the Python script into VS Code and hoping that it's going to run. Uh, VS Code opens folders, um, so now I'm going to create a new folder called Plotly Test, and then select folder, and then this new now this sort of instance of VS Code will open, and in and a couple of things will happen. First of all, it doesn't have anything to do because the folder is empty, um, and it doesn't really know what to do with it because I haven't told it what to do with it. Um, but just sort of give it some something to work on. So you got this little toolbar on the left. Um, I'll switch this to default colors. actually why are you taking some time okay fine um, so on the, there's this little uh, dashboard on the left this icon is for the files this is everything that's in the folder so if I make click on this little new document I can make a plotly test.py which whenever I make a new thing like that I just always try to put a .py file in there because that kind of cues VS code that this is a Python folder um, See, and then it immediately says, there is no Python interpreter selected. You need to select a Python interpreter to enable features such as blah, 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 blah. Um, 
this is one of those things that like I think if I was if I was doing there's something I'm not doing not quite right because I think if I if I did it if I'd done this correctly from the from the conda interface I think it would have automatically loaded that that environment but it didn't um so in the last one it was actually showing a different environment um that was my playground environment just like random for random stuff but this one it doesn't know where the python interpreter is um probably because i closed it real i made a new thing but it's whatever um and so this has detected because i opened a dot py file that i probably want a Python interpreter to go to it. Uh, this probably wants to have a Python interpreter attached to it. Um, but again, just to, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second, but uh, just to be a little sort of, just to belabor the point. Um, I, so I opened this plotly test folder in VS Code. And then when I when I over here when I created this plotly test.py, that just makes a file in this folder. So I can make a new one called blah bloa, <laughs> which now makes this sort of like non-file here, right? So so I'm just so this panel here on VS Code is just kind of a window into the files that exist in that folder on the computer. If I delete this, that one goes away too. Ha. So um but right, so it says, so it needs a Python interpreter. It needs to know, you know, and that's, if I if I were to run, try to run this .py file, it would, if I was like, you know, you know, print hello Twitch. <laughs> See, that's because that's you guys. Uh, and I can make this bigger. View, appearance, zoom in, control. There you go. Um, so if I if I were to try to run this, this this is a Python command, but it needs to know how to interpret it. So it wants it wants this this it wants it's going to want to send that command to some Python.exe program on my computer. But as we have seen, I have many python.exes on my computer so it needs to know which one to send it to so i want to send it to the virtual environment that i made for this project um so i can i'm going to click this here i could also click this one down here that they do the same thing and i think this will drop a drop down menu right here yeah so this is th these are all the different versions of python that it uh yeah, don't worry about it, Kylie. Just, just, just follow along and, and like, you know, you can come back to this later if you need to. Uh, you're probably close enough to Texas that the rolling blackouts might actually affect your internet access. Um, but so this is this is going to be a list of just like all the different versions of Python that it has on my computer, um, and specifically, and this is all mostly stuff that I've seen before. But you can see this one. So this. This, this is a playground environment. This is just stuff if I'm doing just random stuff. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, um, that I have. And you can see that the that the that this this version of Python, which is Python 3.9.1 with 64 bit, its name is Playground and it's handled by Conda. Um, and it is at that dot conda slash ends slash playground dot python exe, right? This is the path to the Python executable for that environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of interesting, like the how that history kind of evolved. Oh, is this built on Unix now? It's kind of. I, I I bounce around between like Windows, Mac, and Linux, and it's always kind of like the thing that always gets me is like like Deer or that or LS, and like it's it's fine. Um, so it doesn't. This one doesn't know where my. Um, the plotly environment is so i might need to find it so i'll do till squiggly which this squiggly line is um that's just the path to my user profile um so like here 
uh, c c colon slash user slash John Ma. That is my user profile. And in pretty much any context, you can replace this this whole thing with the with the tilde. Yeah, PowerShell is definitely, I think, PowerShell is better. Like Windows is generally just kind of a sloppy operating system compared to a, compared to like Unix and Linux. Like that's why, you know, like blue screen of death was a thing. Uh, less so these days. Um, actually, I'm not, even, I'm not gonna buy a top. Oh. Hmm. Uh, actually, I actually wish there was a better way to do this. Nope, that was the wrong one. Uh, dup, dup. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? Yeah, it's a lot of, um, what's the word? I think a lot of these like big software systems have just gotten a little too, they're, they've all gotten like pretty unwieldy. And like I had a friend that worked at, like as a programmer at Microsoft and he's just like, yeah, there's just places in that code that like, oh, hi. <laughs> hi, gilf machine. <laughs> Sorry, I missed your thing. Thanks for showing up. <laughs> Glad to have your gulf machinery on, on board for us here. Yeah, I think that's one of the nice things about VS Code is that it just, it, it remains kind of lightweight. Um, what am I doing here? Why doesn't that, this doesn't have anything in it. <laughs> Thanks, Gulf Machine. Thank you for, thank you for your contributions. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I'm screwing something up here because this environment doesn't actually exist right now. Uh, you know, it should. Okay, so I'm a little bit lost here, unfortunately, because it doesn't seem to, I made this, I made like Plotly is, a, is an environment that exists, I think. <clears throat> um, conda info, the conda list, dash dash ends. Conda info, conda info. So, yeah, so it exists, but it doesn't actually have a Python version in it. And I think it's like, there's something I need to do. I don't quite remember how or what. Uh, 
to actually get this to there's something you need to do to get this to like populate um i don't know what it is Like this one has all this stuff in it. Maybe I'll let's do this. Yeah, it's now I'm trying to make a new environment. That's kind of like the whole whole thing I'm doing right here. Conda and remove dash dash name plotly. Well, I probably can't do it while I'm active. <laughs> uh, deactivate. Okay. Conda create. Dash dash name plotly python equals 3.8. I'll just tell it to specify a specific version of Python. There we go. Yeah, so telling it the specific version of Python. Well, stick around, MyCon, because I'm gonna, if I can get this working. Yeah, so some, for some reason, when I did it last time, it didn't actually install anything. I don't know why, um, but I just, I redid the command saying Python equals 3.8. Um, and now it, it seems to actually be doing something a little more meaningful. There we go. See, so yeah, see. Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, so now that this environment actually has stuff in there, so you can see, uh, see conda info dash dash ends. Now in this folder, there is there is all of this stuff, including this version of Python.exe, which is the one I needed. Um, so I can say. Conda activate, activate, plotly. And there you go, there's plotly. Um, and I'll close you and I'll say code. And now we're back in the same folder. Um, although we're still using, it's still for whatever reason. Yeah, I use, I use a lot. Um, yeah, that's actually probably true. Uh, Windows is still the king of, uh, it's still the best one for gaming by a, by a mile. And Twitch is mostly for gamers. Uh, and even people like, I, I'm like, I'm a, I'm a neuroscience professor, but I do, I do play a lot of video games. Um, but anyways, just to, to keep on point. Um, okay. Thanks Kylie. I'll, I'll keep speaking to your ghost. Um, uh, so the so this one is still using it's still pointing at the different at the other version of Python the other environment for whatever reason I'm not quite sure why oh it's because I told it to yeah let's delete this for now um, so it doesn't now it says select Python interpreter and I say up here so it pops up and it says it's trying it's asking now for the path to the version of Python that I want to use. So I'm just going to go down and select this plotly one, which is the environment that I uh, I made for these purpose. Click, and then when I do that, the first thing that I notice is that down here, it is now using the right version of Python, like the first the, the version that I want. Before it said play playground. The other thing that happens is when I once I select that, it makes a new folder in in this in this folder called dot vs code and in that it can the, the dot vs code folder contains settings that are specific to vs code um, and including that is this settings dot json and if I open that uh, make this a little smaller so you can see it 
this just sets the environment python dot python path equals and then it's just again a path to the version of python that i made for plotly yeah yeah it's it's specific like the 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 so in this folder and again that's why like vs with something like vs code you're opening a folder um it's saying like within this particular workspace like we're in this workspace we will use this version of python and that's that is the virtual environment that we're that we're using here um so uh now so i can interact with this i can i can interact with this version of python in this uh anaconda prompt window so like i can install pip install numpy from here and it will install it's already installed there um i can also um i can make a terminal and i and it'll be the same you can still do stuff there so pip install uh matplotlib oh matplot <laughs> I guess I should use Plotly because I just but this one is called Plotly. And so now when it's installing these modules, it is installing them specifically to this this Python virtual environment. Conda install bumpy dumpy. Oh conda, right, right. Thank you. Sorry. I didn't know that. But um this is like the uh the, the thing like it's a known fact amongst educators that your ability to spell is goes away as you get closer and closer to the whiteboard. And I think it's a similar vibe here. Yeah, and I'm not I'm always it's like the differences between like pip versus conda is like not a hundred percent clear in my head. Um so I'm a little sloppy with which one I use. Um but I definitely should be I think I think I think you want to be mindful of which one you're doing. But this one I've noticed actually just today when I was poking through this folder, um, there is a pip. Pip is in here somewhere. Like here's pip. So the conda environment creates pip. Uh, so um, anyways, why are we still are we still thinking over here? What are we thinking about? Um, they do for the most part, but Gilf Machine is, is suggesting that they can, it, it can cause bugs, which I think is probably true. Um, but I, I have done in my sort of sloppy days, I've, I've, I've used pip to install stuff to a condo environment and it's been fine, but I don't doubt that it's, that it's a little sloppy to do that. Yeah. And sometimes like things don't, it's, it's a whole vibe. Um, <clears throat> And uh, I need to, I'm gonna try to power through this so I don't, uh, just so I can kind of get where I was trying to go here. Um, but so right now we have now, we have, let's see, working through this. So we have installed Anaconda, we have opened Anaconda Pump, we have created an Anaconda environment, we have opened VS Code, we have selected a Python interpreter, and now we're gonna set up the VS Code debugger. Yeah, VENV Venv is like another way to handle virtual environments um, that, uh, it does a similar thing. It just instead of in, instead of uh, so like so when, with conda when you make a new environment it puts it sort of in the conda folder like in you know on your machine. When you do a virtual environment, it makes like so like this venv office is was made by venv. Um, and it makes it in the folder. So it's, it's, it, it's nice cause it keeps it together, but it's annoying cause it keeps it together. So Conda, it's kind of a trade off, but they, they're doing the same thing. And again, in this folder, there's a, you know, in here somewhere, there's a thing called python.exe. Um, but anyway, so now we are in this place and we have, we have the correct Python environment, uh, established. Um, and so now we're ready to start writing code. So we can say, uh, so I installed Plotly, so I can say import Plotly. Notice that um, when I typed 
because I have now, yeah, because I have selected the interpreter, it knows to turn the import statement red. Before, when I typed import something, or I think I typed print something, or um, I could say print hello Twitch, uh, it changes the colors of the text because it knows that it has Python, so it has it's called PyLint. Um, and PyLint is like a linter that goes through and it says, ah, import. I know what import is. That's an important statement. I'm going to change its color. Um, before, when there was no Python interpreter selected, everything was white because it didn't know how to interpret one, one word versus another. So that's kind of, so the fact that the colors are showing up correctly is a sign that, you've, that you're at least pointed at a version of, of Python. Um, and so now I would like to set up the debugger, which this, which Mycon, you may, this may be of a benefit to you because a lot of people I, I realize now, I've, I've, real, I've been realizing recently, a lot of very advanced coders don't use a debugger and they do, it's just all like print statements and stuff like that, which is, uh, which is, a, which is one way to do it. Um, but, uh, it is, um, debuggers are good. Um, so let's do, let's just type some stuff. And so that F equals nine, uh, which is F equals nine for some reason. It's just like, that's my default random line of code. Um, and um, I don't know any fun things in, in that. So, so we can, so this dot here means that it's unsaved. So I'll hit save, now it's saved. Um, and then this, uh, so I could run this here, and that will just run the code. Um, but nothing will. But it, that's that's you know it'll just run, and it will probably say, it will say, print says hello Twitch, and then nothing nothing interesting happened. The end. Um, so here, this play button with a bug on it. That's the debugger. And so I click on it, and it says run and debug. Um, which I can do. I'll just I'll do this and then I'll do it another way. Yeah, it's, um, Gilf Machine has is on the right track here. Uh, I tend I almost never use this, um, but it can just like like is it going to throw an error? I think is a good way to do it. Or I think if this was like a more established piece of code that I just wanted to run and I didn't want to have the debugger active, then I could, I could use that. That's just that th this play button up here is just like run the code straight up. It's, it's as if I had typed Python, what is this? Plotly, plotly test dot pi. This command is, I, I think is pretty much the same thing as clicking this button. Um, But, so I'm going to say run and debug here, and, uh, and I'm going to put a breakpoint here. So this little red dot is a breakpoint, um, and that means that when, so with, so Python is a scripting language, it's like REPL or something like that, meaning it's not, it doesn't go to like a, um, what's it called? What's the thing that makes the, like C++ has a, thing that makes it into a program I forget what it's called um, compiled it's not compiled it's run line by line um, and so this red dot here is a breakpoint and that means that when you get to this line stop and don't go beyond that and that's a really helpful way to figure out like what's going on in your code so I can say run and debug and it will say I don't know what you want it's like this is a Python file so it needs to know that it's a Python file and not one of these other things so I do that and it runs and it gives me all this stuff and it says which version of Python I'm using and it says like which debugger I'm using and a bunch of other stuff and it gets to here and then it stops. Um, and this yellow line with this yellow, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, this yellow tab um, means that the code is currently on this this line. Um, and then this this thing shows up that says you're currently in the, in the in the in the whatever um you're, you're currently the debugger is active um 
but I'm gonna stop that because this is annoying because you because you every time you do this you'd have to start you have to select this one so instead I'm gonna uh, right here it says to run to customize run and debug create a launch.json file so I'm gonna click on that tell it it's a that and then and then it creates this launch.json file and that also goes in this dot vs code folder um, and this is the default and this is and it's fine um, mostly I don't change this the only thing I will sometimes change in this launch.json is this so program and then whatever this is the, the the default configuration is I usually just push f5 and the default configuration is that it will run whatever is the active window so if I try to push f5 it tries to run this JSON file as a Python and like it doesn't work because it's not a Python file. So what I can do is I can right click on this so this plotly test.py, I can right click on it, click copy path, and then go over here to launch.json and then just drop that bad boy in there. And then do stupid windows backslashes because Someone made a bad call in the 80s and we still have to deal with this shit. Um, and so what this does is no matter which one is running here, uh, yeah, so it's, um, I'll show I'll show in a second. It, it, it is pretty, it is pretty nice. Um, so this means that like, even if I'm active in this one, when it, when I run the debugger, it will activate, it will run this script. Um, so I hit F7 and F5, and there it is over here. And so my favorite thing here, uh, maybe I should have a different. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna switch over to a different um, environment now, um, because it's, I don't want to write the code, and I have another. I already have stuff that's more interesting. Um, so. Uh, open wrong app. And then I think this one runs. Does this one run? This is my R uh, this was my original. Uh, uh this is me I'm playing this is me playing around with like with this stuff. Uh using plotly. Um and there's a lot going on here. But I'm gonna stop it here. Uh Again, just putting a breakpoint there. And over here, I've already got all this stuff uh, set up. And it's actually, this is using the virtual environment env. So you can see that, it's, that that's the active Python interpreter. I've got some Git stuff set up. And then if I, in, in you know, and the, the launch.json is already there. The settings.json is already there. Um, so I will... I don't know if this will be helpful for you, Micon, but I'll, uh, this has been very, it's very helpful for me. Um, my favorite, the thing that I was real, uh, the, the thing that was always really hard for me to find uh, outside of MATLAB is, is this variable window. Um, so I'll show you how that works right now. Um, so again, this is the same setup from before, just with a little more of a, a little more active code. Um, and this is just loading in. This is actually, I think, the exact same this like data that's being loaded here is the exact same data set that's in this that's part of this video and i'm just playing with it it's it's funny um so if i click run and it pops up here this over here is all of the variables that are defined within the instance of Python that's currently running. And as it's paused here in the debugger at line 29, this is this is what currently exists. Um, so for example, on this line, I'm gonna make this array called head, it's just like the marker numbers that are associated with the head, 15, zero, and six, don't worry about it. And now I can do a couple things. So here's all these buttons up here, right? Um, and so this one is continue. And that means just keep running, right? So the breakpoint says pause on this line. If I click continue, it will go until it hits the next breakpoint. So if I if I just click this now, it'll go through the rest of the code. Um, 
Which I'll just do that just for funsies. Uh, there you go. And that makes this. Oh. Uh, something's not working. Oh, they don't like it. Never mind. <laughs> uh, don't worry about it. The code doesn't actually work because I was playing with it earlier, but that's it doesn't. It's not relevant. Um, so if I so right so now we're back where we were. We are paused on line twenty nine, um, and you'll see that there over here in the variables there is no variable called head. Um, so. So th this, this continue button says it will just continue the rest of the code until it hits the next breakpoint. So I'm gonna put another breakpoint on arm. And when I click, when I click continue, it will, it will release the breakpoint here. It will run through line 29, line 30, line 31, and then stop on line 32. Um, and, and you'll see what happens basically. So, boink. so I just pop through and now it's back on this line and now, because it has gone through these lines, you can go in here and see now there is head there, there is spine there, and there is right arm there. And you can look inside all of these variables. Uh, so head is its length is three. The you know these are the you know indices you know zero one and two. Um, you know it's got all the stuff in here. You can go because you're in the debugger. You can go to the debug console. And you can say, what is, so here's head. Oh yeah, okay, what is head um, dot, you know, underscore, what is, what dot, dot shape? Uh, actually she doesn't have that. Oh, it's a list, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, you can say, oh, well, what if, what if I wanted to say F equals nine? F equals nine, boom, so there. So I can, so I've now, I've created a new variable. This is as if I just plugged a new, uh, I'm just like writing, Python scripts in the context of this, of, of, of this, of the, of the situation as it exists right before we run line 32 of this code. Um, so I can say, okay, well, what is, so head is a list that's there. What is the, what is the zeroth element of that? Oh, that's right. Oh, it's supposed to be 17. So I, let me, I can actually change that to 17. And now the variable has changed. Um, and this is very, this is a very helpful thing. Uh, now the other thing you can do is the call stack is, is nice. There's only one, there's only one, you're only one file here. So, but if you were like, if you had another file, um, MyCon, this might be helpful for you. Like this will tell you if you're like, if you were in one, one file that called another file that called another file, this will tell you like the stack, like where you are in the stack. Um, also, there's a lot of as you as you start developing stuff, like there's gets to be a lot of variables. So you can you can add variables to the watch list, and that just sort of pulls them out so you can keep track of them as they get loaded. Um, so that was the continue button, right? So continue just just goes until it until it hits either the end of the file or the next breakpoint. But um, you can also do go line by line, and um, so step over is just go to the next line, go to the next line. And this, you can, this is a really helpful way to debug. Um, and this is also like, if someone gives me code and I want to figure out how it works, I'll often just run, you know, start it up, put a breakpoint at the beginning of the file and then just step through it line by line, um, just to see what's happening. Um, step, now there's a little bit of a difference. So I've been using step over um, and what step over does is if this line was a function call, step over it just goes to the next line of this file. It ignores anything that might be happening in that other function uh, and just goes to the next file. That's step over. You can also step into. So I don't have any functions in this file, but if this line was a function, and I stepped and I said step into, it would go into that function and then pause at the first line of that function, wherever that is. Um, and then step out, I think is the opposite. I think if I'm in a function and I say step out, it will run through the rest of that function and then pause when you get back to the previous context. Uh, 
doop, 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 doop. So you can just pump all the way through. Um, so this is helpful too, like, it, you know, and this, this starts getting into, this, this code doesn't work after this point. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that's how, uh, that's how a debugger works. <laughs> um, and then this one, I guess, is restart. And then this is just stop. So now we're back out. Now we're nothing. Um, but yeah, so that's... Uh, oh, yeah, good call. Yeah, for loops are interesting because you can kind of... Like, like, if it's like for one... For, you know, if you're going for like one to a thousand and you're trying to step through it, you don't want to have to go through it a thousand times. You're just like, okay, I get what's happening here. Let's go to the next one. Um, so yeah, being able to use like, I'll often just, you can just put a breakpoint at the bottom and say continue. Um, all these are good options. I just think it's a much, it's a much more, I mean, you can do, obviously everything you, you can do with a debugger, you can do by just print statements to console. But the debugger kind of I, like, it lets you sort of be in the space of the machine while it's running your code. Um, and it's just really helpful. And like I used, I, I took like a couple classes in C++ coding. Uh, I mean, like, yeah, I don't know what you're using. Uh, a, peop a lot of people use just like, like Atom or stuff like that. And like, I think you need to have a program that has a debugger to be able to use it. Um, and mostly like, I just use it like that because like MATLAB does that by default like that's just how matlab works um and so when i started trying to switch from matlab to python i realized how heavily i depended on that variable list um that uh i just i didn't have it oh i also wanted to show so vs code does another really cool thing which is these cells so um let's do this so in VS Code, uh, you can always create, you can turn any VS Code script into an IPython script. Uh, I mean, this is VS Code, so it, it has, it has, it's a, it's a full-on IDE. It just, it doesn't have a compiler associated with it. Like Visual Studio has a compiler. Um, VS Code does not. I think, I think that I think that's the main difference, but like Visual Studio made both of them, um, but it's getting a little below my depth though. I don't really know, but I do want to just say one more thing about IPython um, before we before. I think I can call VS Code an IDE, <laughs> in an integrated developer environment. Uh, but yeah, I mean, people will use it. Like, yeah, you can you you can like link it to CMake to compile and stuff like that. But I don't I don't work with that kind of code, so it doesn't that never really it's not relevant to my to my life. Yeah, I mean, I guess for Python, uh, I don't know. But I do okay. I'm gonna say one more thing about IPython just to just to complete the set, um, and then I'm probably and I'm gonna probably call it a day because I'm tired. And it's Friday. Um, but I, I think this is super clever, the way that VS Code integrates this. Um, so in, in VS Code, if you ever type hashtag hash, which is like the comment variable for Python, percent percent, uh, VS Code recognizes that and, and creates a cell. Um, and the reason why that's so clever is that because it's, it's, a, it's commented out, it's a comment, tag um, if you just run this like a python file it will just ignore that line um, but vs code knows to look for it and make a cell there and also this symbol here the percent percent that's how you signal the start of a cell in matlab uh, because i a lot of a lot of like python's like data analysis sort of methodology is lifted off of matlab um, matlab was lifted off of mathematica and now python is lifted off of matlab um, and so this is a way to kind of like, you can treat any Python script as an IPython, in an IPython way. Um, 
by using that tag because just VS Code is clever. I don't think a debugger can work for C because something in C needs to it needs to be compiled, um, and so once it's compiled, it doesn't really do things line by line in this way. I mean, at least at least to my understanding. But I don't work with that. I don't work with C, so I couldn't tell you. Um, so then once you're in here, you can do you can run cell, you can run below debug. So I actually don't know what that means. Um, but so right here, I'll do is I'll say run above. When I do that, it opens this IPython window over here. There it is. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks, Gil. So, thanks, Gilf Machine. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so now that I'm over here, so now I have this IPython thing showing up. This is kind of like um, the debugger. Uh, except it's except it's not. It's just IPython. So this is kind of like an IPython notebook. It's using a Jupyter server. Um, so over here I can do you know f equals nine and then run that and then and then now there's a variable called f and it equals nine. And if I say no, that I don't want that. I want it be f equals nine ten. I think this will work. No, I didn't like it. Oh, because it needs a comma. There you go. And that's a list, and I can click on it. And it'll show me. There it is. Um, so this is this is nice. I don't know why I always type F equals nine. I literally I really don't. It's just it's what I've like every time I'm because what I like about what I, I, I like I like to do like something equals something because that way so like if I'm in uh, like a command prompt, I can do like ipython. ipython. It's just like it's my version of hello world. Um, and you can just say f equals 9. It doesn't require you to import anything. And then I can say uh, and then f equals. So like I, I've just been doing that for years. I don't know why f equals 9. It's just. That's the way I like make sure that I'm like in a code environment. <laughs> it's just like my it's my version of hello world. Um, and it's just like yeah, it's <laughs> um and uh yeah, so IPython is really good like cuz like so say there was some to like right here, right? Say I'm I'm trying to build this code up piece by piece, but like I couldn't remember like the right call I can't remember exactly what I call it so I try this and you know oh it didn't work right like why didn't that work oh because I, I put a typo there and I, I do that and it's like I was like oh, okay that one went fine let me see did it, did it load in correctly oh yeah there it is um, so so with IPython you can kind of treat your code like chunk by chunk um, <clears throat> without necessarily having to like rerun it or like restart the debugger. Um, and I, it's it's helpful because you can kind of like, it lets you kind of treat, like like zoom in on one little part of your code and kind of iterate there um, somewhat independently of the rest of the of the thing. And, and again, like you can do, and like you can, like IPython notebooks, uh, JupyterLab notebooks are IPython by default, but I find those kind of limiting for the same kind of reasons I don't like uh, PyCharm or or um, or Spider because like they feel a little too special purpose, right? They they're intentionally hiding a lot of the power of like Python as a language from you in order to make it a simpler experience, which is good. Except sometimes I want the full powered version, so I think um, this mechanism of uh, of like basically letting you fake IPython by having this little like hash percent percent tag. I think it's just a really clever thing. Um, and I'll kind of go back and forth when I'm developing, like I'm, as I'm getting into Python, I'll go back and forth between using, between running in the debugger and running in IPython. Um, sort of, a, I, I, as I'm sort of, I'm still kind of feeling out which is best for which purpose, but um, it's, I've found it to be helpful to have both. And I kind of just discovered 
I kind of just discovered this. Oh, um, IPython stuff over here, but it's 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 nice and uh, yeah, and I'm excited about uh, I don't know. Python is super cool. I I I had a I got a lot of mileage out of MATLAB, um, and it it was a it was a good place to start on. But like ultimately, as I've said several times on this stream, now that I'm a, I'm a professor. Um, before I was a postdoc and a grad student, and it was just like get the work done and get get the job. But now that I am actually responsible for people, I don't feel great about teaching students, training students how to do data analysis on MATLAB because MATLAB is a very expensive, closed source tool that's really only used in academia in some engineering environments. So the vast majority of students that come through my lab are not going to stick around in academia. Um, and so if I train them for years how to get really good at doing stuff in MATLAB, they're going to go out into the job market and it's not going to serve them very well. So I think it's so I've been trying to work really hard to like learn how Python works. So that way I can switch all of my research and analysis into Python. So that way, as people as I'm training people and putting them through my lab, they'll be picking up skills that will directly serve them after they graduate. Regardless, even if they stick in academia, it's still better to do stuff in Python because it's more powerful than MATLAB. Um, yeah, it's like, Matt, so MATLAB does have some advantages. I, I often, I talk a lot of shit, but I, often, I do feel the need to defend it sometimes. Like, it's nice that it, it can be nice that it's a closed environment it, and it's a closed environment. It's completely like internally consistent. The documentation's always there. I can run a MATLAB script that I wrote 10 years ago on the current version of MATLAB and it will work probably without an issue. Um, and so that's that's helpful for the scientific world because things are things are stable. Um, but also like it's becoming less and less of an issue. Um, and so I think that my MATLAB has a role to play in the scientific world, but like ultimately it doesn't really vie well with my like with my ethics and my beliefs about like how we should be operating as a as a culture. Um, anyway, it's six o'clock on a Friday, and I'm tired. But uh, thanks for sticking around here, guys. Thanks for. Uh, thanks for joining us, uh, Gilf Machine and Zeka and Mycon. Always a pleasure. And anyone else who might be lurking that I don't, that I don't know, I'm glad that you are, glad you're you're around. And uh, yeah, I, I'm thinking I'm thinking Friday afternoons might be the the, the time. Um, but I reserve the right to uh, to float around. Uh, but um, but yeah. Thanks for popping by, guys. Bye, 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 Kylie's ghost. Uh, nice to see you there in the future. I hope I hope the future is 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 nice. <laughs> and uh, anyone else who might be seeing me in the future, I hope your future is also nice. Uh, okay, I'm gonna go now. Bye, everybody. Thanks for popping by. Ah, <sighs> we can dream. Okay. Bye. Are we here? Oh no! So I, have, I clicked. I was clicking the chat button. <laughs> I should probably click end stream. I'm clicking end stream now. Bye.